So Venia Logan is an expert in social communities, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So my name is Venia Logan. I am an online community architect and the founder of a company called Socially Constructed Online. I actually built my entire company off of the back of a specific social communication theory. All communities, all infrastructure, all governments, all organizations are built on the back of conversation. And therefore, community management is going to be the primary way that businesses are going to build, collect, and aggregate. That is definitely an interesting theory. How do you go about that? Because generally, if you have a community, there is usually a or a few leaders. Yeah. In any community, uh, there is a small little nucleus, the organization or the internal community team or the chief stakeholders. They're going to be responsible for actually keeping the boundaries of the community somewhat firm, right? They decide who comes in. They decide who becomes veterans. They decide how people build. In the case of brands, which is probably the majority of the audience here, your organization, your company um, is responsible for bringing those people in providing the content to keep them interested. There needs to be value and utility in that discussion. But your job is to get peers, your audience members, to talk to one another. There's a difference between an audience and a community. Communities are a segment of a culture that you are looking to build where they need to talk to each other. It's all about peer-to-peer self-disclosure. If you don't have that, you don't have a community. So. This idea is building a stakeholder group that is capable of encouraging all of that chaotic conversation, and it becomes bigger than your organization. You become a node, you become a nucleus in the community of your constituents. I agree with you, first of all, about everything starts from conversation. Everything starts from relationship, right? Because think about all the businesses that start and for the most part, most of them start with partnerships. A lot of businesses are not started by one individu individual in absence of other people slash a community. How would you describe the differences between what you just said and the way we think of companies and organizations now? I'm not seeing exactly how it's different. In Web 1.0, that's when businesses came on. They were coming from a very traditional understanding of how marketing works. Radio was one to many. Television mm -hmm. was one to many. Commercials were used in order to fund the programs that would operate. This was a read situation for your audience. Mm -hmm. Read only, then, yeah. Then the internet happened and we came into what is called Web 2.0. Web 2.0 happened in or around 2006 to 2008. We saw a transition from the internet as an accessible place for people to read to an internet where people can create mm -hmm. and build information. So now we moved from this concept of one to many to a concept of peer to peer interaction. Communities have been a part of the internet since time immemorial, right? Um, people yeah. still think of like those AOL chat rooms and those mm -hmm. web forums, stuff like that. Now, for older individuals who are coming into online spaces, and especially companies, all they heard was get you a Facebook page. You can advertise your products, you can do the thing. They were coming from an understanding of marketing in which you had conversion rates of a specific audience, a specific number are interested, and then a specific number of people will open up a cart and a yet even more specific group of people will convert. So there were these percentage conversion rates. And if you think about that, that's a behavior that you are asking a user to do. Is that mm -hmm. one to many or many to many? It's one to many, right? So we are still operating on web 1.0 infrastructure, despite a highly social creator environment where people don't want to go through a funnel. They want to mm -hmm. spend time getting to know you, getting to understand the people behind the brand. You can no longer have a brand voice, so to speak. You're not cute and fun. No, you are a group of people inside of a company who are going to create a longer relationship and you have to turn that into a community. Okay. To do that, you have to make something that's magnetic. You have to collect your audience and then you have to convert that magnetic audience into a proper, stable community 
with you at the center. It seems to me that most communities that are set up, their goal is to make money. If we're talking about business, right? There's a plethora of, of communities that are just there to serve other people, like lean in. There's nothing to buy, right? Um, women supporting women, and it's a great idea, but there's still so many communities and more and more coming on board mm -hmm. where their goal is the same thing. Maybe they're going about it in a slightly different way, but it yeah. still sounds, I don't know, disingenuous in a way to, mm -hmm. to be touting this, oh, come to my community because we're a great community and we all care about whatever the issue is. Yeah. There's still a transaction to be made for yes. the most part, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And community managers struggle with this too. At what point in time is producing a community for other people's sake supposed to uplift and fund your own personal life? At some point, you mm -hmm. have to make a transaction. So there are two things that I'll use to describe this. The first one is a very simple way of understanding where this is going. And then the second way is slightly more technical. Okay. So if your community was a beehive, you have a bunch of bees going around doing a bunch of stuff. Your company can be one of two things to that beehive. You can be a bear or you can be a flower. If you look at a flower, it is in a specific place. It doesn't move. It just says, I am a resource. You can come to me. You can grab nectar. Isn't this really nice and super pleasant? You can take that value back and you can make your own honey. This could be what we call a lead magnet, a PDF that is free provided to your community that helps solve a very specific problem. And you can give that flower away. Blogs are another great opportunity. You can give people 10 to 12 blogs that say, here's who I am. Here's what I'm good at. Here's why you should follow me instead of others in the space. And you should join my community because you will receive more nectar. That's the flower. And it sounds really great and really, really nice, right? Well, mm -hmm. at some point in time, you have to harvest your community's honey. At some point in time, you have to be the bear. Mm -hmm. Being the bear is not a bad thing. That is you cashing in on all of the nectar you provided and then taking that honey back for yourself and saying, I'm going to stop giving you nectar and resources. And I'm going to ask you, I'm making the ask, buy my product or join the VIP membership portion of my community to receive extra benefits. You could also ask for donations, a Patreon account, where it's like, I will continue producing this nectar, but mm -hmm. in order to do that, I need money from you. So that's the easiest way to think about cashing in on a community. Knowing when to be the bear and when to be the flower is the game that you're playing. Do you have any tips about how to recognize when that time happens? That's what gets us into our second, slightly more technical aspect, right? There's a progression in your community from not really knowing much about the users who are coming in. They're kind of glancing at you as if you're like checking each other out in the bar. And then at a certain point in time, you're like, hey, let's go to coffee, right? Yeah, let's, let's do coffee. Here's what I am, here's how it is. And then you go, do you wanna do like a formal dinner date? Dinner? Do you that? <laughs> and at that point, they've moved closer to your community. You can mm -hmm. use metrics to understand this. Customer lifetime value, the amount of posts that they put in your community. You are elevating their empowerment and asking them to raise their hand when they interact on community to say, I'm ready for the next step. It's almost like that conversion funnel that we said you yeah. can do. But this time it's about in orbits around your community. Hmm. And they're just kind of hanging out and then they take a step closer and you're like, okay, cool. And then they take another step and then you say, hold on, you can't take this step unless I take something. Right. At this conversion rate, there is, oh, it looks like you're a super valuable member of the community. You posted like 20 times. Would you like to come to a webinar about this product that is going to cost a little bit? And then on the back of the webinar, you say, hey, this webinar, this one hour thing uh, is just a small part of a great e-course that we have on this exact topic. Why don't you take it? And the e-course is very specific and it's maybe $600, $1,200, depending upon your area. If you're in a finance area, it's going to be higher than if you're in a product area. And then you start selling that product. And then once you do, they've taken another step closer and they find, surprise, surprise, a closer knit, much deeper, far more cohesive group 
in a VIP community. These, these are all the special people. Why don't you intermingle, network, get the connections, and suddenly there's value beyond your product. Right. It's, a, it's all about orbits and connections and letting people do whatever they want with your brand, with your community, doing anything. And every time they take a step closer, you make an ask. It's so interesting because the concept, I have not looked at it or thought about it in an orbital sort of context. I still have it in my mind as kind of a funnel. So it's just an interesting way to look at it. I guess if, as long as you're sort of building cohesion in, in a group, you're building a cohort, so to speak, building yeah. a community, I guess that's the difference. It's not a one-to-one. -one. Exactly. And the beauty of this system, um, there's actually a company with an amazing community generated system. You can load it for free. It's something that I recommend to my clients. It's called orbits.love. And it is exactly this orbit system. But I also want to offer another analogy. We kind of touched on a little bit earlier where you are a nucleus. You're like the DNA nucleus of a cell. Everything is coming from you. You are setting a precedent in a defined community to believe in a, diff a specific thing, have a specific goal, uh, perform specific objectives. And you are saying this precedent is where we want to go. And then you build momentum to it. I don't care what job you have as a community leader. If you're an associate, a facilitator, a moderator, if you're a community lead, all these positions, right? I don't care what specialty you have in community management. Your job is to set a precedent for a thing and then build momentum until the community is doing that thing on its own. You're right. the nucleus. You have a very firm set of rules, a community charter. You have a community strategy. You have a guidebook or a rule book for what community members can do for your brand. And then you have community guidelines. Very firm. They don't change. And then you say, do whatever you want. Just make sure you follow these rules. And right. you will see it grow organically. You won't have to do anything. You set precedent, build momentum for that to just become a part of the culture. And then you, your, your hands are freed up the second they take it over for you to mm -hmm. do another thing. You're building growth, firm nucleus, super salient, do whatever you want, sell walls. For a funnel, it is perform specific tasks that I care about. Right. And then I will reap the returns of the value. Which is interesting. Um, actually, I see the kind of correlation in terms of where we are in time when you look mm -hmm. at web one, web two, web three. Because even in a web two world, the Facebooks, the Twitters, et cetera, the parameters are definitely very much set. But it really is a one to many in a way, even though it started to de become the creator economy because I can make a post, you can make a post, I can comment on your post, but it's all, uh, it's all owned by centralized, um, the Facebooks of the world who can do what they want with it, right? Having a community just takes it to another level where it, it's self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing you say. It's self-sustaining. And it, I guess that can happen now in these times because mm -hmm. we've moved from a very individualistic kind of society to a sharing society yeah. right but the idea of sharing so much about yourself really only i mean i might this is not a data point but i would imagine i'm correct anecdotally that it really came about with the facebook and mm -hmm. other social media platforms yeah. and so if you're creating a community you're basically, well, strengthening the sharing in a world of trust because you're in this community, because you trust everyone in this community. I tend to use theories and sayings and metaphors as a shortcut to really understanding this huge mercurial, ethereal concept. It, it truly is social scientific, right? It's, it's hard to get into your head, you know? Mm -hmm. So I use a lot of theories to do that. And what I think you're talking about is something called social currency theory. Before any money at all has changed hands, you have already conferred a certain amount of social assumptions about the people you're talking to. Do I trust this person? Do they have a good enough resume to suggest that they can do what they're saying they can do? Is there some proof that they have built a reputation enough for me to trust them? And then with every interaction between there and handing over cash, you are making these determinations. First, is it useful? Are they consistent? 
Do they have merit? What about their reputation? And all of that is building into a specific metric of trust. So that's what social currency is. And now we're in a world in Web 2.0 where social currency is the pervading factor in all of your business. And there's a problem here because in the financial Web 1.0, your financial assets were garnered by gaining things, by encouraging money, by gaining product Mm -hmm. and then selling it, by accruing assets. In social currency, you accrue social currency, you accrue trust by giving it away. You are losing assets and in exchange, you are gaining trust. So these are competing with one another, right? Um, You have to be building your social currency bank in addition to your financial currency bank. And one comes before the other, right? You have to give away before you can take, which kind of gets us into where we are now. Where are we today? Community is going to be the future of marketing because there's no way a marketing funnel is going to be able to keep up with the social currency you require to sell products. So community allows you to accrue that without putting in a tremendous amount of work. And is that because, so it's it's not about you spending all the time to create content, but now you have a whole bunch of people all coming together saying, you know, very positive things about this product, this service, this brand, or that person. Here's what I can say super simply. We are moving from content creation by a small group of people who are Mm -hmm. accruing a large amount of trust to content curation by empowering people within a community to create content. And then we are using user-generated content to say, join our community, develop, and by the way, we have resources you have to pay for. You'll get there eventually. And you trust us, right? Yeah. You are empowering and helping your users in your community succeed. And in making them succeed, you are empowering them to, one, move closer to your nucleus, and two, bring other people in. So it's highly yeah. magnetic in that way. You want to build a magnetic audience and then convert it into a robust functioning community. That's so interesting. And what I see, and, and we were talking before about the difference between Web 2, Web 3. Um, mm-hmm. I always say history repeats itself. First, you have, you know, whatever's happening here. And then as you sort of circle around, It's at a different plane, if you will, but it's the same concepts. So for example, one could say we are very interested in brand awareness and finding people who are engaged with our brand so that they become brand ambassadors. Isn't that the same concept of what you're talking about? Yeah. Community is a better way to do that. Okay. It's more affordable, affordable and efficient, just like um, social media became a more f- affordable way to promote various things because for the most part, it doesn't have to cost money. I get it. You can boost and you can pay for ads and blah, blah, blah. But that's what I mean by it repeats itself. I think this is not new. You know what? I, I liken it to, um, I liken it to uh, a software update. Yeah. It is. We've talked about Web 2.0 and how communities work and what it's looking like converting from Web 1 to Web 2. And we've kind of thrown it around a little bit, hints of hearing about, quote unquote, Web 3. Right. I think it is super critical right now that we talk about what Web 3 actually means. Because from Web 1 to Web 2, there was a monumental, a tectonic shift in the way that the internet worked. And at the beginning of Web 2.0, at the very, very beginning of Web 2.0, we had AOL messenger chats. We had bulletin board style systems where people would post and then older posts would scroll down so they weren't there, but they were still there. You could go mm-hmm. read that information if you wanted to. And then it became Reddit. I mean, that's just like another, it's, it's kind of like another iteration, right? Exactly. So what is Web 3 actually? Here's my hot take. Here's my soapbox. Web3 is complete and total hype at the moment. It does not currently exist. Let's unpack that. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to have to back that because it is also highly antithetical to the current conversation about cryptocurrency, NFTs, 
DAOs or DAOs and Discord communities. Web3 is coming out of Web 2.0 because it finds a very specific set of problems. And these problems clash with one another. They're called dialectical tensions between two things. So the first one is a collection of power. A specific amount of people have more power on the internet than anyone else. Facebook, Google, YouTube, these are called walled gardens. Sorry, did you say walled gardens? Yes, they're walled okay. gardens. They are small little platforms that keep you mm -hmm. on it at all times. And mm -hmm. you don't see the rest of the internet through them, right? Google gives you what it gives you and that's it. Web3 sees this as a problem. And indeed, it is a problem. Their solution, however, is not that same tectonic shift. In my view, it's just more of the same. Web3 mm -hmm. views this centralization of power and this abuse of data as highly invasive, it is, highly centralized for power, it is, a financial deficit to the world, and it is. So their solution started as technological in nature. The concept was that it would decentralize and it would make it highly transparent, but in doing so, it would be more secure. It's transparent, but secure. It's decentralized, but everyone can uh, participate on the single wallet, a single blockchain. Here's what we're seeing. Cryptocurrency is largely owned by a chief few people. Those chief few people have developed communities and those individual communities have gained power. Hold on, I'm gonna ask you to stop for a second and go back. You're saying that only if there's a few amount of people that are controlling this, if you will. And, and is it that it's because only a few early adopters decided that they have the, the belief that it's something good will happen and or as an investment, their value will go up and they're the ones that had the money to do it. I still don't see that as something incredibly different from what is. And I just want to clarify for everybody, you can't have crypto or NFTs or Web3 or Metaverse without the technology of the blockchain, right? The idea of it being um, not owned by a specific company, I actually want to address kind of quickly because when you look at various blockchains, somebody started Ethereum, somebody mm -hmm. started VeChain, and I guess they did it in the context of this is a community. It's all open. You can type into your laptop, blah, 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 and you can see everything that's happening. And the reason it's secure has to do with the fact that it is distributed. This whole cup, which you cannot see because I'm in a weird kind of background, instead of having that teacup, I have just a piece of that teacup. You have another piece many hundreds of miles away from me, et cetera, et cetera. And around the world, different computers house pieces of data that when put together, some kind of value, i.e. this cup. I want to make a distinction here between how blockchain and cryptocurrency work technologically and how it has shook out culturally. There's a big difference here because technologically speaking, this is supposed to be the answer to the primary tensions of Web 2.0. You can't have centralized data and full transparency. You can't have complete and total privacy and a libertarian free internet. You, you can't have those cakes and eat it too. The, these values naturally conflict with one another. If you are going to go for freedom, you must sacrifice an ounce of security. Mm -hmm. So Web3 is currently telling the entire world, we have solved these dialectical tensions using technology. And that technology is a highly decentralized blockchain with an immense amount of transparency and everyone gets a piece of the pie. The problem, technology, we're setting it aside. It is capable of achieving this. Culturally, the people who bought into a coin, Bitcoin, very early on, have only mm -hmm. continued to accrue it. They continue to accrue it and increase the value of their Bitcoin by convincing other people to buy smaller shares of Bitcoin. They amass fortunes faster, more secure, and more reliably than oil and train moguls in 1920. And then NFTs happened. We're going to get away from NFTs as pictures or as images or avatars. Let's talk about the technology and then talk about the culture. 
Okay. Technologically speaking, NFTs came about because people discovered that you can execute code on the blockchain. So instead of saying this is a transaction record, you could now say this is a picture. And in mm -hmm. doing so, the script that comes with that on the blockchain is specifically tied to the person who made it. There's a problem here. Just because your description on the wallet is there and the image is present does not mean, culturally speaking, that you own it. Anyone can take a screenshot. Anyone can do a thing. Technically, technologically ah, okay. speaking, that is the case. Culturally, definitely not the case. The technology is broken. It's highly abusive. And in the modern world, in Web 3.0, code is law. Anyone can build a program that accidentally breaks the law, and then they can say, not my fault. The code had a bug. Wow. Okay, hold on. I'm going to reel it back again. Uh, I want to make sure everybody understands wallet. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that a wallet goes with a particular blockchain? I, I think that's true. Like I have VeChain and its wallet, which I forget the name of. Um, mm -hmm. But that wallet is not recognized by, say, Coinbase. A wallet is a piece of platform infrastructure. The code that Facebook runs is different from the code that Google runs. Their algorithms can be viewed as the blockchain. The wallet is the platform underlying the blockchain infrastructure. I think of it, maybe because I'm thinking of it in old school terms, I think mm -hmm. of it as literally like a storage container. It is. An algorithm on Facebook is interacting with a collection of data that it receives from user profiles, user content, and user input. And then the algorithm decides based on that data what it does and does not post onto your street. Blockchain is simply a completely transparent, nothing is lost stream. Right. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not curating actually. It's just recording everything. The reason blockchains are so useful to data engineers is not because of this highly transparent nature that everyone is so hyped about. It's because it is almost virtually lossless. And that is also why blockchains are slow. Blockchains are slow, and I don't think a lot of people really recognize that. No, for sure not. I mean, I always thought that it was instantaneous. So just like in a banking situation, if I wrote you an old-fashioned check, it would have to sit in some clearinghouse and take X amount of days for you to get the money. But you're saying that's not really accurate for the blockchain. It's not that it's instantaneous or not. The amount of energy consumed using a blockchain infrastructure is very high. And the mm -hmm. higher that energy consumption is, the faster the blockchain can process, which makes right. sense. For yeah. it to be as fast as people think, it must be highly energy conducive, using your same analogy as the bank. The bank would have to go register a check, recognize it as valid, and then move it to the user. Instead, what's happening is the user is saying, hey, bank, I did this thing. And the bank is saying, okay, we'll process it in three days, but let's let it go through now. That's how credit cards work. Credit cards are mm. instantaneous because mm -hmm. it takes two to three days for a transaction to be valid. And there's a slush fund on the back end that backs your temporary loan on your credit card for two to three days. And then okay. it goes through and it's fine and you never hear about it, right? The slowness is put after the transaction. The receipts occur immediately. The slowness occurs afterward. I don't think it's the same thing as a credit card, but I think it's that's for esoteric reasons that I don't necessarily want to explain. But I mean, I'm explaining so many esoteric things anyway, which I think is hilarious. The idea of NFTs, kind of returning to this, it is mm -hmm. executable code where the receipt never disappears. And that's right. how NFT operates, right? That doesn't mean that you own the executable code. Literally anyone can go grab it offline or whatever. And just like any other GIF on the internet since Web.1.0, a person can put it into their avatar profile on a bulletin board style system. And is it theirs? Yes. Is it valuable? No. Because what can anyone do? Screenshot the thing and then use it on their own. They can mm -hmm. take it use it themselves. The value of NFTs and the value of cryptocurrency is that it is an amazing first draft of a mm -hmm. phenomenal technology that will eventually allow peer-to-peer -peer networks to act as servers. This is really cool. It's not there yet. Cryptocurrency is just speculative. It's broken. NFTs came up to say, hey, look, cryptocurrency does have a purpose. It does have a use. Buy and an NFT with it. 
Yeah. And then people went, hold on though. There's no difference between that and bulletin board style systems back in 1998, our NFTs really worthwhile. So crypto crashed. So what were the people in power of crypto, culturally speaking, going to do in order for crypto to stay aloft, to stay financially viable for the line mm -hmm. to go up? They need more people buying into it. It's a speculative currency. It doesn't currently have a use. NFTs were an awesome statement to say there can be a use for cryptocurrency, but the infrastructure is not there. It, it's fundamentally broken. So what they did instead, instead of NFTs being the future, instead of the technology being the future, all of these web three things that were being worked on in the background got co-opted and people said, we've built entire communities on Discord and Circle and look at these community managers over here doing this amazing thing. That's what we do now. It's not true. This discussion is a co-opted statement saying NFTs and cryptocurrency still carry value so that mm -hmm. the line can continue going up. Sounds like any piece of advertising that has ever existed. You're buy my buy product now. because it's better. There are so many people who are saying that. I mean, the whole idea of metaverse, right? And mm -hmm. being able to have Web2 is an interactive community, but mm -hmm. within a confine, you called yeah. it a, a walled garden. I like yeah. that. Um, and Web3, is completely open and it's a creator's world we're not there yet you're saying we're not in the place where you know somebody over there can just create some i think about art because that's kind of where most of the dialogue has been of late with regard to nfts but anybody can create one and kind of put it up if you will on the blockchain and if someone likes that particular nft they can buy it and just like in the art world there are mechanisms sort of inherent in that industry that create value by creating scarcity. The difference is that with physical artwork, there is only ever one original and then the mm -hmm. rest are prints and you can buy as many prints as you want. And you're supporting the artist and you have a physical product that goes right. into your home. There's a number on those prints, 35 of 500 prints available. Right. And it goes on to your thing and then it could potentially accrue value. Right. There is still the one original art piece that can only go on one wall in one room in one house. Right. So it accrues that value. The value will go up and down. Mm -hmm. There will never be less of it, but there also will never be a, not a Mona Lisa. The, isn't there still more value in the original NFT, just like the original Mona Lisa is more valuable than the print you buy outside, you know, of uh, someplace in Rome? You have a blockchain receipt right? That says, I own this image now. People aren't going to care about owning the receipt. They don't want to buy the receipt. They want to use the image. Pirating has been a thing the whole time. There's no reason for me to buy your thing. I can just screenshot it and then put it on my built-in board style system. I have to care about buying the receipt for your NFT to care about the NFT. Would you, would you say at the moment, this idea of being able to prove ownership without a shadow of a doubt, for example, in the blockchain receipt is considered of value? Because if it's not, then I don't know how NFTs would have even had any legs from the very first one, Bored Apes, you know, the Bored Ape Lot Yacht Club or, um, or CryptoPunks. The only thing that you can give away for financial value with an NFT is the receipt of the NFT. DAOs and NFT co-ops and with apes, they convinced people that the receipt actually mattered. They convinced you that that has value based upon speculation because at some other point in time, you can sell it. What happens when your buyer stops caring about whether right. they want to own an image? The value of your NFT, because you can no longer sell it, just tanked. So do you have social currency that you can't actually give away, which means it doesn't have value? Or do you have a financial asset that you must keep? But that's true of any marketplace, right? I mean, look at real estate, it's same thing. You know, a uh, hurricane hits and washes everything away and the value of the land and whatever structure might be on it tanks. Until some speculative developer comes to that area and says, I'm going to build in this area. And then you have this sort of new up and coming area that people all want to live in. Here's what I'll say about that. 
you have a cabin in the woods versus a cabin in the desert. What really matters is location, 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 because you can't mm. duplicate Earth. You can have a far away view of the mountains, and that that carries a certain value because people want to live in specific places. Right. Um, and then there's a cabin that is literally just straight farmland in the middle of Kansas. Because there is a tangible physical difference that cannot be duplicated, and buying that reduces the access to it, value increases. Tangible value, like you would see in a house, does not exist in cryptocurrency. We could theoretically, and there are so many papers and there are so many discussions about Web3 uh, for engineers, we could create infrastructure that can do that. We're not there yet. And the people buying cryptocurrency and selling NFTs are telling you we are. And again, I'm not a financier. I'm not huge in crypto. I'm not connected to a bunch of DAOs. This is an important discussion. But my problem occurs when as an online community manager and as an online community architect, my ability to build online communities on Discord and on Slack, they are getting co-opted by DAOs that are selling community as a financial asset, not as social currency. They are getting people to sign on and then they pull the rug pull and they're like, I made a ton of money. Everyone else, I gave the promise of making a ton of money. And guess what? It's not there now. So it's, it's um, what do they call that? Multi-level marketing, essentially. Yeah. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not the marketing around cryptocurrency and NFTs counts as multi-level marketing. I personally think that it's less multi-level marketing and more a lot of people who believe that speculative nature confers to real value. And to a limited extent, they are right. But at the same time, operationally speaking, in order for your cryptocurrency or your NFT to have value, you must have a buyer, you must have a seller. And eventually you will run out of those resources exactly like an MLM well. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All of these people genuinely believe what they are doing and genuinely want to take part in building the future of Web3. And I think that's great. But it's important to recognize we're not there yet. As an online community manager, these communities don't look like communities. They just look like, buy my NFT, I will make you rich as part of a DAO, and then it doesn't happen. Um, so the people that are very, very early adopters in this are making money because the hype is enabling them to find a buyer. Will the bulk of people, if you will, start to say, wait a minute, I don't get this. There's there's no value here. For example, you mentioned look at buying the blockchain receipt, right? Because just for people who might not know, the receipt is the proof of ownership. The idea is if you're going to show that you now own it, people are going to say, wait a minute, as you said, I'm not, I'm not interested in showing all of that. I just want the image. Therefore, it becomes not valuable to actually pay for the original. Your DAO community is the exact same thing as a bulletin board style system. Advertising cryptocurrency and NFT infrastructure as Web3 is incorrect because the infrastructure does not do with the financiers, the people who are buying Web3 and buying NFTs and selling it, are saying that it does. It, it's not there yet. Web3 has not happened. The term has been co-opted as a marketing play. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. So what is Web3 like when it happens? What That's makes a great question. Real? <laughs> um, oh, wow. Uh, fantastic question. And I have a short answer for you, actually, for the first time in this conversation. I have an answer for you. That's all right. I love um, your long answers. <laughs> <laughs> there is a podcast called The Community Signal where another Web3 right conversation this. happened with someone who was far more of an expert than me. And the guy said something that I thought was tremendously profound. In Web1 into Web2, the teenagers at the time were ecstatic about it. Mm -hmm. They were so hyped for Web2.0. For Web 3.0, I won't believe that it's actually happening until our younger generation, our teenagers, are hyped for a new way of internet. When they're excited, I'll be excited. Why? Why is it that younger people are dictating what is real? 
And I don't think it's right to say dictating. They just don't have the same experience, the same history that we have in Web.1 and Web.2. For us, the internet works in specific ways and we've conceptually identified that. And for them, that's not the case. They, they like what they like. They hate what they hate. Like a new employee coming in and saying, wait, something's messed up here. The new mm -hmm. employee can see things that are wrong better than the established veterans who sure. built all the policies and developed all the red tape. Those okay. new people are coming in and going like, wait, no, this will be better. And then when they find better, they will be like this, this is better. Here it is, web 3.0. All right, I think I get what you're saying. I think I really get what you're saying now. Like for us, the internet works in different ways and we saw like this monumental change and we didn't know how to grapple with it. That feeling is happening now, yes, which suggests we're in the beginning of something. But until the other end happens, until all of the teenagers are just like, you just don't understand it, mom. <laughs> it's at that point when something is truly fundamentally new. Okay. All right. That's um, an interesting barometer. Yeah. It kind of makes sense. What you're really talking about is mass adoption, no? In a media study, they call it a saturation rate. So mm. once a technology hits saturation, which is 60% of a population using it, people can say it is fundamental infrastructure. Um, so 60% of televisions received cable going into residential homes. That took 30 years, 60% mm -hmm. uh, of people having access to computers. That took about 15 years. It doubled. People with access to phones took seven years. Seven years, right. Separating okay. from all of that discussion. Let's talk about Facebook becoming meta and then announcing the metaverse, right? It's this right, huge right. virtual infrastructure where it's like, oh, wow, I have an avatar and I'm in a room. How is that different from Second Life, an MMO right. running on PlayStation 2 architecture that did exactly that? We're just mm -hmm. doing it all over again. Is Metaverse Web 3.0? Probably not. Okay. That's, well, I mean, that just uh, validates, I'll say, my opinion that mm -hmm. history repeats itself. It's just like a new iteration. It's just like a software update. There's not a real fundamental difference, maybe some but not a lot of fundamental differences between the way we interact with the web now versus back from the beginning. I think mm -hmm. the only shift that I actually see is this, and I'm talking culturally now, uh, this desire to share everything about yourself. It'll be interesting to see what's next, no? Yeah, I agree. Think about how you date, right? Back mm -hmm. then it was, we need to talk a lot. We need to go on dates. No, right now it's, I have an interest. Let's go stock their virtual profiles. You get used to a virtual <laughs> identity of a person before you get used to a physical identity of a person now. That's that right. was a yeah. monumental shift in history. Okay, I gotta put my money where my mouth is, right? I'm telling you Web3 hasn't happened. I'm telling you all these things. What is Web3 going to look like in my opinion? I think that we're going to see a vast integration of virtual and dialogue life, where virtual life or digital life used to be a degraded notion of identity. Like I have digital friends, right? Mm -hmm. That's not right. a thing now. And it's kind of reversed. Like older people who aren't on the internet yet, they're just behind the times, right? That's not true. They still have completely valid physical lives. They're just analog in a way. Right. So there's right. analog natives and digital natives. And in my view, web three is going to see a complete fusion of this. That to me sounds like an incredible uh, reason for getting involved in this. However, there's a bit of a problem. Yeah. I mean, then that has to do with access, access even to the, the hardware that you need. Go ahead. Yeah. And again, that's why I say technologically, we are not at web 3.0 yet. But eventually with wearable tech and things that allow us to augment our analog lives, we'll get there. Actually, I think probably um, an example that most people will understand is if you have any kids or grandkids, Pokemon. Okay, that I think seems to be um, where we need to stop. <laughs> and yeah. we need to have another conversation or two or 10 or you know 20, one a week. <laughs> for the next couple of years Con yeah because uh, it's fascinating you know because there aren't that many people that talk about the social ramifications of these technologies or the cultural ramifications 
I also want to apologize to all of the NFT and crypto people out there who <laughs> might be somewhat offended by the fact that I'm saying that these are Gen 1 technologies. But in all reality, I, I just want to say be careful with what you choose to invest in. And if you don't understand the underlying elements of the technology, the person selling it to you is probably suspect. Got it. Okay, that's very sage advice, I think, right now, yeah? So, and I love that you shared that with us because it's fascinating um, and taught us a little something in the way. <laughs> Agreed. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And if you do want to connect more, uh, if you want to talk more about this, I'm uh, at Samantha Venia on Twitter. I'm available on LinkedIn all the time. And uh, my company is sociallyconstructed.online, where I build online communities for people. So that's where you can find me. And it seems to me like people would be wise to do so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's Thank the you so much. Incoming client set. <laughs> No, I'm sure it's true. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the time and your thought. You too. Thank you. Okay.